In this video, I'd like to talk about the process of doing two-way ANOVA. Uh, uh, in the past, we've talked about one-way or one-factor ANOVA, and if I were to apply those concepts to a new problem, it would be this. We have four different representatives. This could be customer sales reps, could be sales reps, and the number of items of work that they get done, maybe sales, is represented here. Representative 1 gets 1, 17, 17, 20, 22. Um, those are different values that they sold at, at different time periods. So doing our traditional uh, one-factor, one-way ANOVA, we might analyze this to see if there's a difference in um, how much you sell based on which rep is being used. So if I go single factor ANOVA and grab a block of data and then find a place to put this kind of down here arbitrarily. Um, I do get averages for each representative but the p-value is not significant and so it looks like just looking at uh, different levels of representative alone as a one-way ANOVA that there's not a difference. Uh, however, there might be some additional information we can add to this data set that would help us um, find, so find something uh, important. Uh, so oftentimes we have not just one factor, we have two factors. So we, we would call this two-factor ANOVA. So here we have the exact same data but this time we have five different districts involved. So imagine then, so let's talk about the representative first. So it makes sense that maybe some salespeople um, do better work than other salespeople. Uh, and so we might be looking for a difference in those things. And so even if, even if this same representative sold in m uh, multiple districts, uh, dif uh, different areas, sometimes some people just have great personalities, they're charismatic, they have better training, uh, they might do a better job. Alternatively though, maybe the area in which you sell has its own effect. So for example, what if you were selling some high-end item like um, timeshares in an expensive area like Key Largo and so you um, t sell in, a, in maybe a poor urban area of a given state or maybe a really rich neighborhood and so maybe the area that you sell in regardless of the representative makes a difference. So let's look at both of these things simultaneously. The way we do that is we go to uh, data, data analysis, uh, two-factor without replication ANOVA. Now what that means is that for any one of these rows we only have one data point. If we had multiple measurements of representative working in District 1, we will call that with replication, but we're, for right now we're doing without replication. So I'm going to grab my input range and I need to, I'm going to say I've got labels and I need a place to put my data. Alright, so there's my output. I see some averages for if I'm in a one district or another, and I see some averages for different representatives. Now let's see if either of these factors matter. And so I look down and it says that my p-value is 9.74 times 10 to the negative 5. So that sounds great. That means it's highly significant. And what's highly significant? The stuff in the rows. What's in the rows? That was the districts. So we know that districts matter. Uh, another thing, uh, the columns, that's less than 0.05, so we'll see that that's highly significant, that that matters as well. So ironically, even though by itself representatives didn't seem to matter, when we look at both of them at the same time, we were able to detect that representative does matter if you take into account districts, and uh, districts have their own standalone effect as well. All right, so once we've determined that uh, there are that something is significant, then we can use that as part of an overall predictive, predictive model. So, our, and, and if we didn't find things that were significant, then we, we couldn't really say anything. So, um, I have a list of steps that you go through right here, that if you want to predict now the sales in a given area, you take the overall average, add the representative effect, then add the district effect. So, that means that if I want to 
I, I need to consider the combination of both the representative and the district in making a prediction. So I'm not making some overall prediction. I'm making a very specific prediction about a given cell. So I've done the math right here, but let me do it a second time. Let's just say that I want to get an estimate for representative 4 in district 2. How would I do that? Well, first off, I need an overall estimate. So I type in equals average. So 17.6 is the average sales across the entire data set. Now I want to consider representative 4. Now, um, so what does that mean? Um, in an intuitive sense, think about this as uh, you know, there's an overall, there's a regular mean, and does this mean go up or down if you're representative four? Well, how would you know that? Well, take the average of whatever they sell, and is that above or below the mean? Um, and then we'll take that into consideration in our formula. So I'll say equals the average of this. Uh, minus our overall average and what we see is that it looks like and maybe I should just put out to the side equals average of this and, and actually this was contained below 21.2 I could have scrolled down here and said oh uh, representative 4 actually sells 21.2 I could have gotten it there as well so 21.2 is 3.6 higher than the average so um, we're able to say that there's a positive net effect of above the average of 3.6 sales because you've got representative 4. Now what about the effect of district 3? Or district 2 in this case? Well, uh, this time I'll just go down here and look it up. So the average in district 2 is 14.75. So I'll say equals 14.75 minus the average so 14.75 is worse than the average, so that means that there's going to be uh, a depressing effect. We're going to lose some sales because we are selling in District 2, is what, regardless of the salesperson. So we add up all of these effects here, the, the, the average, the increase for being representative 4, and the decrease for being in District 2. Add all those numbers together, and our prediction is now 18.35. If I want to do a confidence interval, now, because remember, this is just kind of a guess or an estimate. So if I want to say I'm 95% sure of the range of my, of the actual value in that cell, I would take the square root of this value right here, oh, right here, and then I would do, so, equals square root of that and then I would multiply that by 2. So I would take uh, the, the amount that I just came up with, 18.35 plus 7.9 and uh, minus 7.9, and that would be the upper and lower bounds uh, in which I would say I'm 95% confident that the actual forecasted value uh, will be within that range. All right, now I'll go on to my next one. Now here's a different case. Uh, instead of talking about representatives and districts, now I'm talking about the impact of price and advertising. And I've labeled this no interaction. The data has been set up so that we don't think that these two things will interact on this tab. Uh, however, in the real world, they probably will. And we'll see that in the next tab. But um, if you think about the effect of price in advertising, that uh, some you know if you pick any product like an iPhone, that the lower the price, the more you'll probably sell. The higher the price, the less you'll probably sell. Similarly with advertising, the less advertising you do on a product, the more you'll probably, the less you'll probably sell. The more advertising, the more adver uh, sales that you'll probably make. But if you combine those things together, if you have like an abnormally high price, then it doesn't really matter how much advertising you do. If you make the iPhone three times the rational cost, then probably nobody's going to buy it. On the, on the flip side, um, if you make the price ridiculously low and then you have super high advertising and everybody finds out about it, then you're probably going to have a really good result. So there's actually what we would call 
in, in principle there should be an interaction effect between these two things. Um, but let's just go ahead and do a uh, another ANOVA. Um, this one is going to be really just to demonstrate the idea of replication, meaning that in a given cell of low price and low advertising that we have three different observations. So I'll show you how that works. We're actually not going to get an interaction here and that's on purpose. So ANOVA two-way with replication. So I'm going to grab my input range. I'm going to say rows per sample. That's how many rows in each of these um, uh, cases of a certain type. And then I'm going to output my data somewhere and I'll put that right here. All right, uh, the pl first place I typically go to is my ANOVA table. And it shows me uh, this word sample, columns, and interaction that have p-values. Now sample in this case, it used to be rows when there was only one row, but when there's multiple ones, uh, we call it, Excel calls it sample. So uh, it says that the rows matter, it rows and groups of three matter, that's highly significant, as is columns. Uh, and then we have our interactions, which is not significant. So we won't talk about that yet. Um, all right, so because we have determined that there is an impact of the level of the column and the level of the row, we can now move forward with that in creating a prediction. And so I didn't write this here, I should have, but my formula for my prediction will be the, the uh, sales, total sales equals overall average plus uh, price effect if significant uh, plus advertising effect if significant. Okay, so again, we need in order to test out our predictive formula or use it, apply it rather for prediction, we need to pick out a given area. So we want to know either here or this block of three or somewhere. We're trying to say, you know what is the estimated benefit or, or what's the estimated outcome in sales if we have uh, high price and low advertising for example. Well uh, let's start off building our formula then and we'll say our overall average uh, I've actually computed that right here average of D4 to F12 so just the whole thing so we'd say this is going to be 25.037 K uh, now we need to potentially add on any impact from the price being significant, and it is. We found out that the columns were significant. I, actually, I should have written, written rows and columns here, but now I've got to kind of work a little backwards. So is there an impact of price? The answer is going to is yes of course um, but what is that impact well it's kinda similar to this idea that we had before where we're checking for the impact of a representative by taking the average for that case and subtracting that from the average um, here we have the average of this particular column uh, of low price so you take the average of all those numbers and you subtract the overall average which is there in D1 so what this is telling us is there if you have low price on a product that there's an 8.9 unit increase in likely number of sales so that shouldn't be too surprising um, and so we're gonna say if we're testing low price high advertising here we would say uh, I'll just kinda say I'm adding in 8 0.96 and then if we want to know what the impact of having um, high advertising and with my low price same idea um, I take the average here of everything in high and then subtract out the value from the overall average and so that's what you see so the average of D10 to F12 and then you subtract out the overall average and what this tells us is that we get a boost of 7.407 or just 7.40 if we spend a lot on advertising. This makes sense, right? In, uh, in terms of our intuition. So if I just sum up those three items um, that will be an estimate 
of how much I'm going to spend or how much I'm going to earn on, in sales if I add all those together. Uh, if, if, I'm, if I go in that particular cell based on the fact that um, those the, my rows and columns were both significant. Now, um, so that's a particular case that we're looking at. Now, if we wanted to do a confidence interval, a 95% confidence interval, saying that we're 95% confident that the actual value is plus or minus um, two standard deviations from here, we would get our standard deviation from grabbing this number, taking the square root of it, that gives us our standard deviation, multiply it by two, that value by two, and then add or subtract that from that number to get our bounds. All right, now we'll do something similar over here. Uh, this time we've introduced the idea, this data is a little bit different. I've, I'm going to introduce the idea of interactions. So I'm going to do the same approach, two-factor ANOVA with replication. I'm going to grab this block of data. Oops. Um, don't know why I did that. OK, two-factor with replication. And in terms of where I'm going to place that data, I'm going to go down here. All right, let's go look at the results. It says that sample, meaning my rows are significant, columns are significant, but importantly, it says my interactions are significant. And once that happens, I can ignore this other stuff because that kind of overrides the rest. So with that being the case, that my interaction is significant, uh, then what I want to do, so this, so this kind of then plays into this potentially this idea that maybe low price and high advertising have an impact on one another. They work well together. So what I will do is if I want to have the prediction for any given um, case group, it's actually pretty straightforward now. It's actually just the average of, of stuff that's within that group. So I will go so if I want to know low price, uh, high advertising, I just take the average of those three numbers. And it comes out as 51. Um, if I wanted to know medium price and medium advertising, I could do av average of that. And of course, I should mention that this is just kind of the estimate for that cell and if you want to have a 95 percent confident range since it's likely to vary what the actual value will be in the real world you take the square root of this last item in the mean squared uh, column uh, which is within again take the square root of that multiply it by, and then you got the standard deviation multiply that by two add it to this number for the upper bound and subtract it from this number for the lower bound 